Welcome to the Amphibian Press Podcast. I'm V.S. Holmes, and with me today is Jenna Green for the second time. So we're going to take a bit of a deeper look at her novel Reborn and also talk about some of her awesome extracurricular activities. So thank you so much for joining me today, Jenna. Oh, thank you for having me. It's really fun to like see a, a where are they now kind of glimpse, I think, with uh, with a lot of these authors that I talk to, because <laughs> we always have so many projects going on. And then it's like, well, what whatever happened to that? <laughs> yeah, lots of balls in the air, but things take time. So sometimes you talk about it once and it's in the works, and then it could be months or even a year before anything really materializes. So it's good to always come back and revisit and see what's developed and what's stalled and what else is happening. Yeah. So last time that you were on the podcast, um, you know, we, we talked about both of your series, uh, but we, we definitely focused on Reborn and the power of young adult novels, uh, even for, for adult readers. And I kind of wanted to first start off with, has anything um, really changed in the Reborn world since we last spoke? Um, well, uh, well, the novel itself has won two awards, which shows that I don't completely suck at this thing <laughs> called writing. Um, in terms of the world, um, I've been working really, really hard. Um, in fact, so hard that my editors and publishers can't quite keep up. But that's okay, <laughs> because once they get caught up, then um, the audience will be able to probably get books two and three in the series um, pretty close to each other, pretty close together. So the That's second exciting. book <laughs> in the series, Re- yeah, uh, Restore, uh, Renew, sorry, is at my publisher right now. And then the third book in the series, I am editing right now. In fact, I interrupted the wonderful, joyous, not at all tedious process of editing uh, in order to talk to you today. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, this is a, I'm a so nice, sorry good, to interrupt. Good morning break. <laughs> No oh. editing. I it's it's important. I'm actually quite good at it, but I find that I can only do it in very small, small doses before my brain. It's just not as much fun as writing a first draft. That's <laughs> See, I, fun. I feel I wouldn't quite say the opposite, because it depends on what type of editing you're talking about. I hate the little fiddly stuff, but the big revisions for me are so much fun. Like I right now I'm I'm rough drafting two novels at once, which is a terrible idea. And I don't know why I've done it. Um, <laughs> but I, I cannot stand the drafting process. Like, I, I'm just so frustrated. I'm, I'm, I'm an impatient person. So I'm so frustrated that it's like, not some sort of understandable, cohesive mass yet. <laughs> so I, I, I like the revising um, and, and editing process. Oh, wow. Well, we kind of are opposites. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's what, like everyone has a different process, right? I find editing quite funny though sometimes because um, my I'm a teacher, so the school year there's you know I can go two or three months and edit or sorry write all the time, and then I have to take time off for report cards mm-hmm. or concerts or whatever, and then and then I come back to it. So often there's some continuity stuff. So I've been editing and been like, didn't I? kill this character in the last chapter why are they alive and walking oops um what was this character's name it switched halfway through the book and i didn't even notice so that oh, stuff's funny. always really funny because i'm just like oh well there's a that's probably pretty important <laughs> <laughs> so you are eyeball deep in your most favorite part of the process now um <laughs> has has anything <laughs> changed for you because i find with with my process like I do pretty substantial outlining and then I go back through and I change the outline like each time I revise, which I guess doesn't really count as an outline at that point. Have you found a lot of things have changed for you now that you're going back in and revisiting these stories or is it pretty much set in stone? It's really about tightening. Mm -hmm. Um, I draft pretty well. I think I'm quite fortunate in that way. Um, So it's really about you know, just tightening the story, um, making sure the characters are true to themselves in the story. Um, I'm pretty ruthless with Mm -hmm. cutting out words and phrases and paragraphs that aren't needed, which is a vast difference than how I started. Um, My very first book, I didn't want to get rid of even a a pretty word. I was like, but it's pretty. 
my editor's like, but you don't need it. I'm like, but it's pretty or a paragraph <laughs> that they're like, you don't need this. I'm like, but I, I work really hard on it. And now I'm just like, delete, 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 delete. And so it really tightens it up. And, and I think that's why I think that change in my editing philosophy has really made my writing improve over the years in that I don't get quite so attached to beautiful words or phrases. I mean, I still love them. Oh, the power of language. It's um, lovely. I am an English teacher. <laughs> I also know that I need to just cut what needs to be cut and be true to the story and just the best storytelling I can do. So mm -hmm. um, my editing style has changed drastically over the years. And then when I'm just in, I, it's really a lot of word choices, grammar, um, either adding description when needed or cutting out stuff that I describe for no reason. Sometimes I'm like, why did I describe this tree in five sentences? <laughs> I could just say, hey, there was a tree. So editing is fun. I sort of struggle, I think, with I, – I love and I've always loved revising, I think, partially because I get to be ruthless when I'm drafting. Yeah, there, there's nothing to get rid of yet, so <laughs> I'm kind of out, of out of my element a little bit. Um, but what's funny is I – I feel like a lot of people, a lot of writers that I know, um, you know, who, who I really talk process with on, on a regular basis are starting to appreciate the revision process a little bit more. And I feel like they're starting to kind of implement the Marie Kondo, like if it doesn't spark joy thing into their yeah. writing. <laughs> Whereas for me, it's like, I, it's, it, it was harder for, for me to do it in the real world than it was in, in the writing world. I like that analogy. That is, I think that is me. Um, and, and of course, for those, you know, writers that are really struggling to get rid of, um, cause I had to get rid of whole chapters mm -hmm. um, with my Imagine series. And I was like, but, but, and so my, my editor, my publisher, she said, just don't delete them, just save them in a separate file. And then you can always use them for blogs and behind the scenes mm -hmm. Yeah, stuff. And so they're not really gone. And then most of it I didn't actually use. But if you're having trouble getting rid of it, you can just kind of store it somewhere else. So it's um, it's a good technique for anyone that has trouble just letting go. Letting go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I also find, and, and not everyone works this way, of course, but I switch um, the literal program that I'm using each time. I like go to a, a, a different stage of the writing process. So like, and it's not always the same to the, the order in which I go, but you know, I'll, I'll have one version in Google docs. And then when I switch to maybe the second draft or like the big heavy revisions, I'll go to word or to Scrivener. And I think that helps too, because then I know that there is a backup of the original in a completely different program that I haven't touched. <laughs> and, and if I really regret, making a cut, then I, I can go back and find it. Yeah, that's a good, good strategy too. Um, I'm often quite lazy about getting my hard drive and storing stuff to my hard drive, but I also mm -hmm. am terrified of losing my work. So I email it to myself all the time. So <laughs> if ever I, I, yeah, well, I have issues. Um, so <laughs> if ever I'm like, oh, I, I deleted that stuff and I want it back. I can just go to that last email and be like, okay, restart. So there's, there's all, I, I email in my email log, there's all sorts of emails to my, from me to me. <laughs> so out of curiosity, there's always debates about what should be included in, in various books and, and what is written for whom on the internet, because everyone likes to have an opinion. Uh -huh. And I was sort of curious where, where you stood with that as a young adult author, because I, I read a lot of young adult, but I, I, I don't write it. And so for me, I don't mind if there's certain content, um, whether it's explicit, you know, sexual things or if it's violence. But I feel like young adult as a genre or age group, I guess, um, it's not just what is and isn't included, but it's actually sort of the character's arc. Where where do you stand on that? And, and what are your thoughts as, as an actual young adult writer? So I have kind of two thoughts on that. Um, <laughs> one comes from my writing standpoint. One comes from being a teacher. Yes. So I worked in a middle school for 12 years and uh, we always talked about censorship and I'm pretty much against it because the thing about children is, is they don't read what they're not ready for. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I remember being like eight or nine and camping in the boonies 
and picking up my mom's romance novels. And I would read about Victorian times and I would read about a couple meeting. And then once they started taking their clothes off and stuff, I was like, well, this is boring. And I'd skip 30 <laughs> pages and go back to when they're fighting pirates or whatever. Because I wasn't mm-hmm. ready for that. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand the point, but, you know. Yeah. And same with kids. They'll they'll skim the violent parts um, if if they're not really ready for it. And, and just like a, a parent with TV, you have to also be somewhat aware of what your kids are reading in case they want to have a discussion about it. Doesn't mm-hmm. mean you have to read every book that they read because, I mean, my niece finishes three books a week. And I'm oh, a goodness. reader and I'm a writer, but I can't keep up with her. <laughs> but you can still get synopses and you can still have a discussion about themes of a book without having read it. Mm-hmm. Um, in my own novels, uh, I mean, we have lots of violence. People have been right. killed. There is uh, slavery. There's abuse. There's hints of horrible, horrible things. Um, I do have um, a unique point of view about romance in YA. I'm for it. It's fine. But I also want uh, a bit more of the realistic side of teen romance. Um, The fact that you're going to um, meet the love of your life and it'll be your first boyfriend and everything will work out great. I mean, you have to save the world and stuff in between, but then everything (laughs) will work out great is uh, probably not going to happen. So I like to throw in other kinds of relationships where, Mm -hmm. you know, a couple is attracted to each other, but, you know, maybe they're not ready yet or you know there's um a couple where it's just purely platonic they're just friends that's all they Mm -hmm. want to be or someone loves a girl and she doesn't love them back I mean that stuff needs to be in there too and so um that's how my writing tends to go with the romance plus you know I only ever really dated one guy and I married him so I don't have a whole lot of variety (laughs) and experience Uh, to draw back on in my life um so you know I just kind of I have romance but it's kind of not as Mm -hmm. I have way more violence (laughs) maybe that's just more (laughs) exciting to write for me I guess I don't know I definitely agree I I usually include romance because it it is a fact of many people's lives um you know not not everyone but some people but it's funny what, what you were saying about the not not reading what they're not ready for because I, I had a similar experience, but it wasn't um, it wasn't with romance. It was the first time my parents permitted me to stay home alone as, as a kid. And the first thing I did was go to the like bookshelf where all of the grown up books were. Not, not that it was like designated this is the adult section or anything, but it was just like <laughs> where my parents happened to keep their books. And so I went and I found the thing with the creepiest cover, which was one of those scary stories to tell in the dark. And I read the whole thing. And when my parents came home, I had every light on in the house <laughs> and I had the music blasting. And it was like, I was so scared. They, they weren't mad at me even. They were just sort of perplexed, I think. Oh, yeah. My my <laughs> older sister made me watch horror movies. Yeah. Um, my parents went out of town and I hid under the blanket and I was like, I don't like this. Yeah. Kids know what they like. They know what they don't like. Um, why a literature can tackle such incredible incredible themes Mm -hmm. from slavery to voyeurism to racism and um they can do it because they can describe it but not describe it like they can just not glance over stuff but describe it differently than you would have Mm -hmm. to in an adult novel in an adult novel if someone gets murdered you're gonna have to describe it with all the gore and stuff in a ya you can just say they're dead um Mm -hmm. and that's okay at And you can have magic or you can have a dystopian culture. And if you just say that's how it is, then that's how it is. Um, Kids have a a willingness to believe. And adults reading YA do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's a very unique genre and a very powerful genre. And I'm very lucky and privileged that that's the genre that chose me. I don't feel like I woke up one day and said, I'm going to be a YA writer. I just wrote a story and it happened to be YA. I like books that happen to be YA and I write books that happen to be YA even now. And Mm -hmm. so that's what was chosen for me by the muses or whatnot. (laughs) Um, I've tried writing adult literature, but it's really hard. Um, (laughs) And 
I've tried writing short stories and some of them are okay. Uh, and I, I do a lot of, um, you know, short videos and stuff on my Facebook and things about not trying to force someone else's style in terms of writing, but also what you write. Um, mm-hmm. If you're not a short story writer, that's okay. I mean, you can still try, but I'm not a Western author. I will never right. write a Western in my life. Um, and that's okay. I'm not going to force that. I write what I write and I like it and I enjoy it and I think I'm okay at it. So then that's what I'll do. And you write different things and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's something that a lot of authors have a kind of complicated relationship with because so many of us, like even if we want to try new things, you know, our voices, or at least the way we've developed them, you know, aren't maybe suited to that without a lot of practice, at least, um, if, if it is something we want to really delve into. And I think it's good to like, test things out privately, <laughs> you know, on, on our own pieces of paper over here. But I think trying to force ourselves to write something like, oh, well, I'm a grown up and I want to write something, you know, prestigious. So I, I have to write adult as if YA can't be groundbreaking. You know, the, a lot of those assumptions are a little bit uh, narrow-minded, I think, in a lot of ways. It's still good to challenge yourself. I am still right. going to try and write short stories because I'm determined on that path. But <laughs> I'm also accepting of what I'm good at and what still needs work, and that's okay. Yeah, we're, we're all work in progresses for, <laughs> for our entire lives. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. You just mentioned dystopia because that's a pretty common, at least currently it's a pretty common setting for a lot of YA novels. How are you handling the world increasingly looking like a dystopia and writing that? Is that d- d- does that make it more difficult? Does it make it less difficult for you? Oh, there's going to be a long answer and a short answer to this. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, short answer. Yep. <laughs> long answer. I don't know yet. Um, it's hard to view the pandemic and... I mean, I live in Canada, but everything the States does affects us. Yes. Um, and I really just, I think I would view it differently if I didn't have such a young daughter. Okay. She, yeah. she turned through, she turned four just when, you know, we just first got quarantined and, and seeing how everything affected her. And I want such good things for the future. And Reborn was written before she was born. Um, but the sequels um, were written when she was born Mm -hmm. and I think that you know there's a young character named Sira and she's kind of five four or five ish and she's not really seen in the in the sequels a whole lot because I couldn't I couldn't torment this poor little girl anymore when I had a little girl Mm -hmm. and so that's changed motherhood does change your perspective I always said it doesn't but then I had one and now I'm like oh yeah it does (laughs) Um, I think dystopian though has such great power to make us aware of things. Um, think about how the handmaid's tale took off on TV. Love that show. I mean, that book is, well, it's Canadian and it's been around for what, 30, 40 years. Yeah. And yet, um, people have found renewed solace in it. They found renewed passion in it. Um, so uh, dystopian I mean I do classify reborn as a dystopian a dystopian fantasy and when you discuss topics and themes through allegory mm-hmm. um, sometimes it's easier to understand honestly yeah. than to look at your own world and your own potential mistakes to do it through a character and mm-hmm. to do it through an alternate environment well it uh, seems simpler I think yeah. right in in a yeah. lot of ways you can be objective and subjective simultaneously. <laughs> Say what? I always feel like, especially with more speculative works, whether it's, you know, dystopian or pure sci-fi, pure fantasy, I, f- I feel like a lot of times it is a roadmap for us. But I know a lot of readers, you know, for, for so many of us, it's also escapism. And, you know, I, I, I think a lot of us just balance how we're feeling and, and, and what we're reading. But I found myself just just recently reading, uh, you you know Tosca Lee, of course. I was reading her her first book, The Line Between, 
and obviously it's like I'm reading this in the middle of a pandemic and it's about a pandemic and it discusses prions and I just had an extended family member pass from from a prion disease and I'm like what is wrong with me is there like something wrong with me that I'm absorbing this content right now and like you said I think it's really it it adds clarity when you're reading something similar to your own problems and that's the joy of literature overall in that books can affect you differently at different times Mm -hmm. and you can close them (laughs) yeah and you can read a book when you're 10 and it doesn't really have an impact and then you read it again when you're 20 and you're bawling your eyes out Mm -hmm. um or you'll look back and be like oh my gosh this this book that I read so long ago now has this renewed meaning and and that's why literature is so important. Mm -hmm. That's why books of all kinds are just so amazing and so powerful. And, and, you know, there are um, quotes and memes and messages about the power of libraries all around the world. And it's right. Um, Books can change the world. Words have far more power than anything else. And that Mm -hmm. is, uh, uplifting and it's scary and it's beautiful and all those things mixed together. <laughs> just just like language and just like stories. Yeah. So kind of switching gears here. So the last time we, we spoke, we didn't really touch on the podcast that you are a part of. And I would love to get into that more. I'm really fascinated with how people get started with them because this was not, this was not in the plan for me. So yeah, this was, well, it was something I recently wanted and I tried to launch just like a really mini podcast with just funny stories of my life. But um, it I never found the time to kind of keep that one going. And, and apparently my life is funny if you have <laughs> visuals to accompany it. And then my publicist said, hey, want to do a podcast? And I was like, oh, maybe. He's like, awesome. So this is your co-host. This is when you're starting. <laughs> These are your guests. I was like, oh, I'm doing it. Oh, okay. So um, in fact, my co-host and I, who I absolutely adore, um, have never met in person. She lives in Manitoba. Mm-hmm. I live in Alberta. So we're two provinces apart. Um, we kind of got thrown together and it it worked out beautifully because we're in some ways we're exactly the same. And in other ways we're vastly different and it really, really works. And obviously we've only been doing our podcast Quill and Ink for mm-hmm. six or seven months. And yet I feel we're getting better yes. every time because it's hard with two co-hosts sometimes to um, talk over, not talk over each other and, you know, stay on topic, but still have fun. Um, so from episode one in what, December, January to now, I mean, we've improved so much. We're flowing so much better and it's so much fun <laughs> to talk to people. I love talking. I became a teacher so I could talk. I mean, no one <laughs> listens, but at least I get to talk. Just learning about other authors. Sometimes I um, learn new things, um, especially with marketing. I'm always learning more with that. Sometimes they tell me things that I do know, but I need like a refresher course in. I need a reminder like, yeah, I am doing that. And that is a good thing. And <laughs> talking, well, I talked, I, we interviewed you, but talking to so many people with so many different styles and so many different genres and and really um and e- other people that are related to the book industry bloggers and reviewers and editors and marketers it's been it's been so great so far and we've only just started so i can't wait to see where we're at when we reach our you know a full first year or second yeah. or hopefully third fourth fifth sixth twentieth we'll see it'll be really excited to it's exciting to see how it <laughs> continues yep. and who else we get to interview I get really excited. I'm I get nerdy about authors and and my husband doesn't read. He he listens to audiobooks, but so I'm like, <laughs> I get to interview this person. He's like, I don't know who that is. I'm like, well, be cool. It's it's someone awesome. That's so much fun. So are you a, a podcast listener or or were you before you started podcasting? Because I was not. <laughs> um I was not, no. I still um I've now I'm trying yes. to, but <laughs> you know, the four-year-old interrupts everything. So, um, but I do, I'm starting to, so we're on Authors on the Air uh, Global Radio Network. And so I do have a, a long drive to school because I work out of town. So I try and listen to some of their shows, especially Christy Stratus. She's really good. And just try to um, get to know even more authors. Like I feel like I know a lot of authors, but in the indie community, um, there's new ones every day or there's mm-hmm. 
ones that I just haven't happened to come across. So just trying to stay um, abreast of all of that and, and then, you know, try to figure out what other questions I could ask an author that are new or different. Yeah. I've, and, I've uh, tried to. Yeah. So I'm just I'm starting to. At, um, processing information like reading wise. Um, so podcasts weren't something I was drawn to at first. And I sort of like didn't get it. I think I didn't like get what a podcast was. And then um, I I also had a co-host once upon a time. And, um, you know, we're, we're still like best friends. It just, you know, we, we went in different directions. It wasn't like some dramatic thing. <laughs> it felt like it at the time. But, um, you know, so she she was really spearheading it because she l- like listens to a zillion podcasts and she's always sending them to me and I'm like yeah 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 <laughs> so so she was really doing it and then when we parted ways you know I still <laughs> I realized I sort of missed the reaching out and the connection like all the things you were just talking about with these conversations that you have and the things that you learn and the things that you end up learning that you never knew you didn't know you know so so much of that is so fascinating and so I, I kind of kept up with it even though I, I never really intended to um, but, and, and something I, I usually ask when I have a, a fellow either podcaster or just interviewer on is if you could talk to anyone, um, let's, let's make it who's, who's still living. Oh, no, Jane Austen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know but well, the, for me, like the answers would never end if it was someone who, who had already died. Um, but who, who would you want to have on your podcast and, what would be the question you asked them that would be like the kicker? Oh, that's that's not easy. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Is Alex it's Carroll easier, still right? alive? I feel she is. I'm, I know I'm Margaret Atwood that. is. Oh, uh, I've just I've always loved Alice Monroe, and she can write short stories. And I really, really struggle with that. It is a goal of mine. Mm-hmm. I want to get better. I've decided westerns are never going to happen, but maybe short stories will. And I would love to talk to her just about how she. Because I, I can't, I'm a, I can't even write a book that's not a series. So just how does she get those stories and those ideas and those themes just into just a perfect, perfect short story? I just want to pick her brain about that. I think that some of the best conversations I've had, or best isn't the right way to, to, to say it, but like some of the most um, fascinating where I really learned the most were these authors who I, like I, I maybe knew about, but I didn't really know anything about their process or maybe their genre wasn't something I was super familiar with um, as, as a reader and the, the crossovers and then also the like wildly different processes and thoughts that go into crafting books is just so fascinating to me. And I, I think, like you said, it, it's something that you're trying to get better at. And I think that that would be really cool. I've always wanted to, I, I find lately I'm fascinated by either historical fiction writers or nonfiction writers who put so much work mm-hmm. into research. Because I don't do research. I I make everything <laughs> up. I don't have to research what food a culture ate. I get to make it up. I don't have to research. Um, I, call, I do reverse research when I write like the second book of a series and I go back and make sure mm-hmm. that I didn't like change the name of like a species or something. Um, <laughs> so in some ways it's hard. I've done that. It's a bit harder because I have to make everything up. But then the good mm-hmm. news is I get to make everything up. And so, um, and I know my co-host Miranda, she does a lot of research for her books and it's not something that's really in my process. So I find it fascinating that there's these people that are so dedicated that they research for years. That's like, I do like, maybe I'll do like quick research, like for like the structure of a medieval castle or like mm, hobbling techniques and, and things like that. But I don't spend years. I don't even spend days. I admire them. I admire their dedication and their patience. Mm -hmm. That was something that really struck me when I was first getting into All Souls trilogy. I think there's actually more than three books Oh, let's interview her. Oh, yeah. I know, right? Well, I I didn't realize that she was a historian when I read the first book. And then partway through the second book, um, because I'm... I'm bad. I never read the back matter. I, I put so many like cool things in my in the back matter of my own books, and then I never read anyone else's. <laughs> but <laughs> whatever. Um, so I, I hadn't really read her bio, and so I didn't know that she was like an actual historian. So when I was reading the second book, where there's a lot of that historic research that that goes into it, 
I was so struck with how detailed, and I mean, of course, I didn't know if it was accurate or not, but it, it seemed believable. And then when I found out that she was a historian, it's like, oh, so you need like a PhD to write this well. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> or um, like Jodi Picoult and some of those um, and um, yes. uh, John Grisham and stuff that are form- lawyers or former lawyers. And mm-hmm. But, you know, you can take any life experience and um, use that for your writing. Um, I have traveled a lot. And so that helps me, you know, create unique worlds because I can think of you know, countries or cultures and things. Um, I've worked with children of all ages. So it makes it just slightly easier to write children and teens. Um, Mm -hmm. And I do fully believe that authors should get out and experience the world and have hobbies and things because it's going to impact your writing. Maybe not directly, but indirectly. Like, it, it yeah. adds richness. It adds depth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've never written a book about dragon boating, but being around people and being part of a team and coaching and, you know, you learning a unique sport, that's all somehow, some way going to filter in to my writing, even if it's just a paragraph here or an emotion there. And so mm-hmm. um, writers need to live as well. And uh, yes. it's going to pay off. <laughs> In the long run. That's the thing about being an indie author. A lot of stuff is the long haul. The long... I always tell my husband I'm playing the long game. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm going to write a book. And that's, it doesn't necessarily going to be a bestseller. But it might um, gain... It, my first series, I got a publisher and I got a publicist. And then my next, the Reborn series, is starting to get awards and prestige and now I have a podcast and so maybe on my next book I'll get like uh an agent you know things are gonna kind of progress mm-hmm. along and so I always tell my husband I'm playing the long game he's a bit impatient but I've, I've got the patience so it's gonna work out <laughs> see I'm I'm incredibly impatient but I think I don't know if writing is like my one exception or because I'm in control of you know for for the most part, as far as the content and, and that kind of stuff goes, I'm in control, but like the impatience doesn't come out as much. But I, I, I like that you said the the long game, because I do really appreciate a long game or a long con. Um, <laughs> so maybe that's, that's what it is <laughs> appealing to me. It's like, this is just one big long con. I, uh, way back in the day, so we're talking like 20 years ago, I was a distance runner. I couldn't sprint. I only have one speed. Mm -hmm. So sprint dead last um, every time. Uh, But I could distance run. I could just set a Mm -hmm. steady pace and I could go and I'd, you know, finish near the top. And that's just how my writing goes. Um, Plus, I I mean, I can't be impatient. I'm a teacher that comes with a lot of extra work. Especially now. I am a mother that comes with a lot, a lot of extra work. I have hobbies, I have teams, I have committees, I have commitments. And so I just have to kind of plug away at the writing and things. And so I have to understand that unless I quit my job, which I kind of need the money for. <laughs> Love-hate relationship with money. Uh, yeah. I, I, I can only do so much. And so as long as I keep going, whether it's slow at times or quick at times, you know, and I've had to be patient because, you know, my publisher can only right. edit a book so fast and, and get to it so fast. And I could self-publish, but um, that sounds like a lot of work, too. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and so I've chosen the path. And so with it comes pros and cons. And and yeah. <laughs> so for for those of my listeners who are just tuning into you, um, you know, maybe, maybe they they're, they're going to go back and, and listen to the, pre- the previous episode now. But give us a little glimpse about what's next for you and your series and where people can find you. Oh, I'm everywhere. I'm down the street. No, I'm <laughs> um, So just Jenna Green, but green with an E on the end. Um, Tricky. So on, yeah, G-R-E-E-N-E. So on Twitter at J Green Writes, there's the Quill and Ink podcast, um, which is on YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, all those great things. Um, uh, podcast Quill, I think, is our Twitter. Um, JennaGreen.ca on uh, for my website, Amazon, um, and then 
for those of you who have not read Reborn, um, it's really it's a really good place to start. Um, and then as the sequels are going to be coming, they're going to be coming soon. Yeah. Um, but you can read Reborn just by itself. But if you don't want to and you want to know what happens after, um, everything, the ante gets upped in that at, the first book is really about just finding a place of safety mm -hmm. for these main characters. And then in the second book, they have to decide whether they're going to give up that place of safety in order to affect the larger world. Mm -hmm. Are they going to accept the world as it is because their circumstances have changed and they are okay now? Or are they going to risk that safety for the bigger principles? Mm -hmm. And with that is a lot of risks and a lot of gambles and some things are going to pay off and some things are not. And that's what we're seeing right now in the world. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I did finish the second book, the first draft around December. Mm -hmm. And uh, the third book that I'm just editing now, I finished drafting about a month ago. So <laughs> there may be some darkness that parallels some other stuff. We, it, I often can't figure out the parallels till later. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that totally connects. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll have to really think and analyze. Or let my readers do it for me. There you go. Once once it's out, it, it doesn't quite belong to you in the same way. Not the same way. No. <laughs> I'm really excited to to hear that you're trucking along and that we've got even more to look forward to. So. Oh, yeah. It never stops. <laughs> well, I'll be sure to put all of those, those links down below for, for everyone to check out. And now they have a brand new podcast to listen to and or or watch if you want to see at least my sunburnt face in one of the episodes. <laughs> Promise you probably don't, but <laughs> uh, that's that's definitely really exciting. Yours was the episode where right when my computer broke and I had to yes. um, record from my friend's house. Yes. And Who happened to be an archaeologist, which I thought yes, was so wild. She she is. And you were talking about archaeology and I'm and I'm seeing in the I'm not looking behind me, but I'm looking mm -hmm. in the in the in the camera and then it's showing behind me all these archaeological artifacts like, yes. well that's a weird coincidence yeah. <laughs> some some strange synchronicity going on <laughs> yeah see it was meant to be yes <laughs> well thank you so much for joining me again today and sort of diving deeper into some of those topics and also being game to dive deeper because i know sometimes the you know a lot of things that have opinions attached to them it can be a little tricky oh it was so great to uh come on and talk i'll talk about books my books someone else's books i don't care i will talk <laughs> about books nonstop. so thank you very much for having me and letting me talk a little bit about my own stuff and so yes, and just how i feel about literature in general because it's my passion <laughs> well that that definitely shows so yeah thank you thank you very very much yeah no problem this has been the Amphibian Press Podcast. I'm V.S. Holmes, and with me again today was Jenna Green. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>